Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Danielle and today I'm really excited to continue my series on domestic violence. Today, as you can see, this isn't my normal filming setup. I'm actually at Sojourner Peace House with Executive Director Carmen and we're gonna be talking all about domestic violence in particular in regards to how it affects our local area, how we've seen everything with the pandemic affect domestic violence, and Carmen's gonna just share some things about domestic violence that we really need to be aware of and we really need to know. So I'm so excited to be here with Carmen today for this interview, so thank you so much for joining me. Now, if you're new to my channel, thank you so much for stopping by. I would love it if you would take a minute and hit that subscribe button down below, ring the bell so you never miss a video, and don't forget to like this video and please, please share this video as you know, if you're a current subscriber, my channel is all about positivity and helping you be the best version of yourself you can be physically, emotionally, and mentally, but it is also all about really bringing awareness to important topics that we really do need to be educated on and really do need to know about so that we can really take action and really be able to help people when they need it and really help those wonderful organizations in our community to really serve our community the way that they've been doing and continue to serve our community in a way that really benefits us all. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get into the interview. Now, Carmen, the first thing that I do wanna ask you about is a little bit about your organization. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about Sojourner Peace House? Yes, um, first of all, I wanna thank you for having me and for all of those who are tuning in, thanks for tuning in, it's an important discussion. Sojourner Family Peace Center was founded in 1975, and we opened the shelter, Sojourner Truth House, in 1978. So we've been around almost 50 years. In 2019, we served almost 12,000 individuals, and we had over close to 90,000 contacts. And so I like to think about Sojourner in three different buckets. One is crisis housing and shelter for women, children, and men. We just started sheltering men this uh, January, and this year we welcomed men into our shelter. We have a 24-hour hotline, crisis hotline, confidential. We have individual support, which is uh, our hope and healing and our case management services that help people with uh, the things that they need to uh, move forward in their lives. And then the third is systems advocacy. So restraining order assistance, we're in the criminal courts, the civil courts, children's court so those are the areas that we operate in i think i did read online that you do work with the district attorney's office to help women too if they need that as well. right so the district attorney's office before covid was located right upstairs in our building and they will they'll return after the pandemic uh, moves through they'll be operating out of our building after they are done with the conversation with survivors they bring them to us and then we have a confidential conversation about things like safety planning What's happening in your life? Is there any kinds mm -hmm. of emergencies that okay. you might need help for? Are you worried about your children? Do you need other uh, partner services that are here in our building? How can we as a local community really support your organization? What do you need from the community right now? You know, the other thing I forgot to say is Sojourner, we have a co-located model. We have 14 partners in this building, the innovative model, uh, an innovative way to do the work. I think what we need in the community is all of us as organizations. So it's not just Sojourner Family Peace Center. There's Mug American Women's Association, Latina Resource Center, the ASHA Project. Um, many other organizations working to end violence in families' lives, ending domestic violence, sexual assault, and trafficking and child abuse. So I would say, number one, we need people to get educated about the issue. We need to have a different kind of conversation in the community about this issue. What is it? How can I participate in uh, knowing what I need to know as a person? Because I can guarantee you know a survivor. You know someone in mm -hmm. your life, and I'll look directly at the audience. We all know women, children and men who've been impacted by this mm -hmm. issue. So the first thing you can do is be a safe person. Educate yourself about the resources so that if mm -hmm. somebody comes forward to you, you can say, number one, you're not alone, it's not your fault, and I'm here to help. Of course, all of us as organizations need time, money, or treasure, right? Volunteering, right. 
making a donation, right. contributing to the cause in some way. And generally speaking up in your life, right, about the issue? Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's really an interesting point that a lot of these things, so it's not just about domestic violence, but it's about domestic violence, sexual assault, all these other things, just violence in families in general, right. they all go hand in hand. It's not just one issue, but it's a lot of these issues are really intertwined together. Right. And sometimes, probably a lot of times, you're dealing with multiple multiple issues in one family mm -hmm. that are all intertwined together so really important to realize that and as so, well I think. You know sometimes Danielle um, they're co-occurring and they're generational so you'll mm -hmm. have you know we, we will serve the kids of the grandmothers who lived in our shelter. Right. So we know that violence is a learned behavior and if you don't do something to interrupt it it will pass down the family right. line. Right. Yeah, that's really that's really important. So getting into talking more specifically about domestic violence, mm -hmm. you know, I guess what would you say in layman's terms to you, what does domestic violence mean or what is the definition? That's a good way to ask the question. When I'm teaching, I always say it's a pattern of coercion and control mm -hmm. that one person uses against another. It could include behaviors such as physical abuse, mental abuse, spiritual abuse, psychological abuse, you know, it can be subtle or it can be mm -hmm. severe, but coercion and control that one person uses against another. And uh, the most important thing about violence, I think, that people need to understand is it's not all uh, severe violence. It can start really subtly in your life, someone right. controlling where you go, what you do, whether or not you have money, can you mm -hmm. see your friends, those kinds of things. And in this culture, we, we confuse that with love. Mm -hmm. Often you'll hear survivors say, well, I thought he loved me right. because I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't do anything, he wanted to be with me all right. the time. Well, that's not love, that's control, uh, eventually, right? We all get into relationships that are really intense in the beginning, but if that doesn't level off at some point, I would say right. it enters into the realm of control. I just did a video last week where I talked about boundaries, and if you missed my last two videos on boundaries, I did an interview at the Milwaukee Women's Center uh, a couple weeks ago on boundaries where we talked about specifically boundaries with victims of domestic violence. And then last week I talked about boundaries as it relates to domestic violence from a standpoint of really paying attention and being aware that certain things can become warning mm -hmm. signs. Yep. And being able to set good boundaries in a relationship is really important because if you don't learn how to do that, things mm -hmm. can escalate and it does happen over time. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, if you meet someone and they're abusive right away or they're really controlling right away, it's not attractive and you realize right away that this is not what you want but these types of things do happen over the course of time typically. Right. So a lot of batterers are charming. It doesn't start always with severe violence. It happens as you said over time and it's important to pay attention to those warning signs. Uh, if it's moving too quickly, too fast, if you're not able to set boundaries, then those can be warning signs mm -hmm. that the relationship is headed in a, a bad direction. What have you seen specifically in Milwaukee County? And let's talk specifically about since COVID, since mm -hmm. quarantine and beyond. Have you seen any change in regards to statistics or what you've seen specifically at Sojourner Peace House? Well, you like know, our this? numbers um, have, have always been high. So I would say that the levels of violence, whether or not people have been paying attention to domestic violence, have been high for years in this city. So we know we have this generational cycle, as I said. For years, we've known that the grandkids of the grandmothers uh, are coming in for services. Again, learned behavior that's repeated unless there's an intervention. Under COVID, what we're particularly concerned about in the fall of last year before the pandemic, we had an escalation in homicide and we've had um, what I consider beyond a state of emergency related to homicides. We've had 43 domestic violence related this year. And that's troubling. Um, and it's troubling because COVID is keeping us all locked mm -hmm. down. And uh, if you're someone that has used violence as a strategy and learned that it's a normal behavior, you're more likely to use it when you're stressed. So COVID has created mm -hmm. stress, chaos, uncertainty about the future. Most of our clients report volatility. You know, our, our clients are saying that the abusers are unpredictable. There's more fear, fear about what the future, financial stability, and a lot of victims are, are reporting that they don't feel comfortable leaving. So I worry about how people are trapped. And one thing I do want to interject here that I think is really important, 
your organization and other organizations like yours are more important now than ever. Because of the pandemic, because of COVID right now, a lot of people that may have in the past turned to families or friends mm -hmm. for a safe haven or somewhere to stay or right. turn to are not doing that because of the pandemic. Maybe their parents are elderly and they fear for their health and they don't want to unnecessarily mm -hmm. turn to them because of that. Or maybe their friends mm -hmm. aren't comfortable having other people stay with them right now because of the pandemic, which is why now more than ever, your organization really is important and it's important to increase awareness. Before COVID, you could go to work and you might have a chance of speaking to someone. You might be able to talk to EAP. You might run into a coworker or who might have a question about what's happening, see an injury, intervene on your, you know, ask you what's happening. We're no longer worshiping and living mm -hmm. in the same way. So the opportunities for people to help us or have been diminished and the doorways for us to move through have really, really shrunk. And so that's a great concern to us. The governor's order did give permission for survivors to leave when we had the lockdown and I was grateful for that. Yeah, so that's if, really... if your safety is in jeopardy, you should be reaching out to somebody if you can. I want to talk about the top three myths related to domestic violence because when you talk about educating people and really making sure for you, if you're watching, that you're really informed and educated, what are the top three myths that you find people believe about domestic violence that aren't true? Um, some people believe it only happens in certain communities, mm -hmm. poorer communities, and we're here to say it happens in every community every walk of life, every religion, every socioeconomic class. Uh, it happens, uh, all of us as human beings are eligible to be hurt by others. And so most people think, well, it's just those people. That's a myth and a misperception. It can happen anywhere to anyone. And what other myths do you hear a lot? That the alcohol caused the violence, you know, he mm -hmm. was just drinking. They're really separate behaviors. Mm -hmm. You know, alcohol will lower your inhibitions. And if you have an alcohol problem, we recommend that people get, you know, help for that. Right. Uh, that's a, a way to self-medicate. But really, the, the use of violence and the belief that you can mm -hmm. use violence in your life is a separate issue. And uh, they can co-occur, but they're really, they require two separate interventions that right, are related. Right. So that's a second one. I think a lot of people don't really give credence to or think about the fact that this can happen to men as well as women. Absolutely. So I was really, I really like the fact that you said that this year you started housing men as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think men often feel like they don't want to say anything because they feel like it's not manly or that they shouldn't have this happen to them or there's an even greater sense of shame because they're a man but especially if they're a man that isn't prone to violence and knows that they don't want to hurt a woman mm -hmm. they might be afraid to defend themselves because of that and you know it's a challenge to your masculinity to mm -hmm. say i was hurt or beaten we have men who are in same-sex relationships men who are with women who are abusive we have men who grew up as young boys who watched their mothers and um, you know, for us and for me, I believe this is a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, says we all have the right to live say, in safe and security, safe right. and securely. And uh, that doesn't matter what gender I am as a human being. And so uh, you deserve dignity, respect, and love no matter who you are if you've been hurt mm -hmm. um, as a human being. We are here to help you. Right. And another thing, too, I think that's really important to say is that, you know, sometimes we see incidences of domestic violence that don't escalate to a physical level where someone's actually being physically beaten, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a victim of domestic violence, like right. you said. Psychological, mental, spiritual abuse, all of those levels of abuse are forms of domestic violence. Mm -hmm that do take place and just because you don't physically see that somebody has bruises or mm -hmm. they're not saying that they've been physically hurt in some way doesn't necessarily mean that right. there isn't domestic violence going on in that relationship or household and I think that's really another important thing to mention as well. The other myth that I hear a lot about is well why doesn't she leave or why doesn't the victim leave or the survivor leave and they don't leave because leaving is hard and it is not easy to leave a relationship and especially if you've been in you know under a person's control maybe you've never had a job have your own money you're dependent on this relationship you don't speak mm -hmm. the, the language you're uh, undocumented you're new to this country there's all kinds of ways that people get sort of stuck in uh, the relationship and they do try to leave but leaving can be difficult so that's the other myth 
that I think, and that's really the wrong question, I believe. The question should be, why do we have a human being who believes they can use violence against another human being? So why does he do that? You know, why does she do that if she's abusive? That's really where we need to be putting our focus. So obviously safety planning is really key. If you're somebody that's currently in a domestic violence situation and you know you need to leave and you really fear for your safety, then really developing a safety plan in an organization like Sojourner Peace House is a great place to help you do that and really help you craft that safety plan. But what would your advice be to somebody that might be watching this, Carmen, and maybe they know of somebody or suspect that somebody could be in a domestic violence situation, what advice would you give them to be well, a support? First, I would say get educated about the services. Get online, get on the computer, and look up some of these organizations. Look up their addresses, get on their websites, look at the information that's there so you can be a resource for people uh, who are needing help. Be a person that understands what the resources are. are. Then, if you have had violence in your own life, Heal yourself, and we'll talk a little bit, I think, later about what healing might look like. But, you know, you can't be there for someone else if you have your own woundedness around that issue. Try to be a safe person when someone comes to you and says, this is happening, believe them. Say to them, I believe you, thank you for coming to me, I will help you. It's not your fault, you're not alone, and I'm here to help are the three messages I think survivors need to hear. I think that's really, really important. And the other thing I want to say about this too, and we're going to talk about this more next week, we're going to talk about recovery from domestic violence and how you can best recover if you've been a victim or if you are going to be a support system to someone that is a victim or has been a victim, how you can best be a support system, but really to make sure that you are giving them as much power as they can have, meaning that you don't want to press them or force them right. to talk about things before they're ready. You want to let them really set the pace as far as what they're willing or able to share and when they want to share it because I think that's really really important right I think that's what respect would be is to allow the person to come forward in the way that feels comfortable for them. a lot of people don't know that though they think they're being helpful by pressing and just oh come on you'll feel better if you talk right. about it but I think we have to remember that we're all unique individuals and we all process pain in different ways. And there's different ways that we all really heal as well. So we'll talk about that next week. So Carmen, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you guys found this helpful. As I mentioned, I am gonna be sharing my personal story today as well. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but thank you so much, Carmen. Thank you so much, Daniel. I did say that I was gonna share my personal story in this video, and I will be honest, the more the time came for me to record this video, I kept putting it off and I did become a little bit anxious, and then I got really sick, and then I thought, well, I've been really sick, I don't feel well, maybe I will just skip it, but I realized that I really do need to be courageous and brave and tell the story. I've never told this story publicly, and it really goes to show that even though you can heal from trauma, absolutely, and you can move on from it, that it still unfortunately does affect you for the rest of your life in some way. And I really want to use this story to potentially warn and help others that might be in the same position that I was in or might know somebody that is in this current position. And I wanna really use this story to bring awareness. I've always said on my channel that if I can use my past mistakes, my past hardships, anything that I've gone through that's been negative in my life to really help bring awareness or help other people that I definitely do want to do that because then anything that's happened to me that's been negative will not be for no reason and it can be used for a purpose. I'm willing for my pain to serve the purpose of helping others and if that is what this does, then I'm more than happy to share it. But bear with me because I have never shared this story before. So my story really starts with me getting a job at a family owned grocery store in my senior year of high school. I did a lot of different jobs around the store. I worked as a cashier, I worked in the deli, but ultimately my main job ended up being making freshly made pizzas that we sold in the store. Our customers really did like them and I really liked making pizzas. It was a fun job, but one of the parts of the job that was really kind of hard for me was emptying the 
condensation that would drip into a big bucket underneath the cooler at the beginning of, of my shift. It was pretty heavy and I had to walk into the back of the store and dump it in the produce sinks and then just put it back into the cooler. And over time as I was doing this, the produce manager that worked there saw me kind of struggling and he would always offer to help me and he always did it for me, which I thought was really nice. Well, over time I continued working there and Brian was working there as well. And we would just say hello and talk very casually and briefly because we were both busy. He would always empty the condensation bucket for me under the cooler and we just kind of went on. As I continued working there, one day his friend came in and pulled me aside and said, you know, Brian really likes you and his birthday's coming up and he really wants to take you out for his birthday. Well, let me just say that I didn't find Brian attractive physically. I wasn't attracted to him at all. I knew that he was older than me and I was only planning to work in the store for the summer and then I was gonna leave for college. So I wasn't really planning on meeting anybody and I wasn't really interested in that. I had had one boyfriend in high school who was a year older than me he went off to college when I was a junior and we broke up when he got to college because he wanted to focus on college and his studies and he felt like a long distance relationship was too hard for him and so we ended up breaking up and that left me pretty heartbroken. If you haven't watched any of my other videos then you won't know this but if you have then you know I was not popular at all in high school. I didn't have any friends and I really didn't have very much experience at all with dating or the opposite sex and so I really just wasn't interested and I said no but his friend was really persistent and he begged and begged and begged so I finally relented and said fine I will go on one date whatever I guess I don't care well Brian was about 11 years older than me and being that I'd had one high school boyfriend for about a year and when you're in high school and you're not really working, you know, you don't really have a lot of money. I remember when I was in high school and dating Dave in high school, a big date for us was going to Pizza Hut and sharing a pan pizza because that was kind of a splurge because he didn't have a lot of money and I didn't have any money. So that was like a really big date for me. And that was the extent of what I'd experienced in dating. It hadn't been anything lavish or expensive by any means because I was so young and just dated a guy in high school for like a year and that was about it. So. I went on this date with Brian and I don't remember where we went, but we went to a really fancy restaurant. It was really nice. He told me to get dressed up. I did. He kept saying how beautiful I looked and how amazing it was to be out with me and just lavishing me with all this attention. And I will admit that I was impressed by the fancy place we went to and just how he was treating me. And then we went back to work. And shortly after that, I began getting a dozen roses at work every single week. And I knew that they were from Brian and eventually his best friend admitted that they were from him. And then he really, really liked me and he wanted to date me and I put him off for a while because again I still wasn't really attracted to him and I was thinking about leaving for college and I just wasn't really interested but over time he kind of wore me down I agreed to go out with him again and the thing that really I guess impressed me was he could afford to go out all these fancy places and buy me things and I never had had this before and being that I'd never really had anyone, girls or boys, show me any attention because I wasn't popular in high school, I will admit it felt nice. And I started really enjoying the attention and the gifts. Yes, I would say we did start dating because I was pretty lonely. I didn't have really any friends and you know, he was someone to spend time with and he really was taken by me. He treated me like a princess. He was you know, like I said, taking me all these places, buying me things, we were going out for fancy dinners. And then when I went to college, everything kind of changed. I went to college in Mequon, not very far away, but far enough away that I lived in the dorms and I wasn't around all the time. That's when I noticed that his attitude really started changing. He got really jealous, he got really possessive. He was calling me all the time and wanting to see me all the time. I didn't have a car up at college, so I couldn't just come home whenever I wanted. So he was randomly driving off to school a lot and it was really starting to bother me because he was interrupting my studies and time with my friends and things that I was wanting 
wanting to experience being a freshman in college, just joining different groups and meeting new people, but he was absolutely livid about it. He really didn't like it. I spent really nearly every weekend with him. He would pick me up and we'd spend the weekend together and we'd have a good time, but I really noticed that a lot of the times he'd be irritated with me, he'd be angry, he'd be sullen, he'd be accusing me of cheating. Over time, he would tell me things like, you know, you're not really that pretty. You know, you're getting pretty fat. You know, you really aren't that smart. And I want you to bear in mind, for those of you that know me personally, and I don't care that I'm gonna say this, I weigh about 125 pounds now, I'm like 5'1". Um, at that time, I weighed about 100 pounds. So he was starting to tell me that I was really getting fat. He was telling me all these negative things about myself. Now bear in mind, because I wasn't popular in high school or grade school, and I had been bullied throughout my entire school career, elementary and high school, I had a really poor self-image when I met Brian. So when he started telling me these things, over time, I really started to believe them. And he would say things like, you know, I can't believe that I spent all this time and money on you. You're not even appreciative. Like, what do you do for me? And he just became really possessive and really jealous and he would yell at me. And it became really nerve wracking. I became really anxious and kind of fearful whenever I would be around him for any length of time. I tried to make excuses on some weekends when I didn't want to go with him, when I didn't want to stay with him, um, saying that I had too much homework, saying that I had things going on. And he said, you know, if you really love me, then you'll come with me. You can study at my house. If you really cared about all that I'm doing for you, you would show more appreciation and you would be with me. And over the course of time, a couple times I tried to break it off, but he he would cry and he would become really depressed and say he was suicidal and then he would threaten to hurt himself and he would tell me all the ways that he was going to commit suicide and kill himself because he absolutely couldn't live without me. And this really started a path of psychological manipulation with him. I didn't understand at all what was happening and what was going on, but I became fearful that I couldn't leave him because if I did, then I would be responsible for him hurting himself or potentially committing suicide because he would always threaten and sometimes he would even do things to himself and he'd show me the things that he did to himself because I would make him so upset by threatening to leave him and it just made me feel so trapped. I just felt like I didn't know what I could do and I didn't know who I could tell because he threatened me that I better never say anything to anyone other than he was wonderful and he was the best boyfriend I could ever have. And he told me numerous times that I would never find anyone else that could ever love me because I was ugly, I was fat, I was stupid. I remember the first time that I met his parents and I'll never forget that meeting because his mom was sweeping the kitchen floor and his dad was in the kitchen and his dad was really abrasive to me and really kind of rude and he said, you know, I don't understand why you're in college because women have no business doing anything but being in the kitchen in the bedroom and you're never gonna do anything with a college degree if you even graduate because you're not smart enough and that's not what women are for. And I was just stunned, I was taken back. I would never met an adult that didn't think that college was a good idea and I'd never met an adult that was so rude and I had just met his dad and that was the first thing he said to me but I understood then where Brian got some of his personality traits and his demeanor and the way that he spoke to me because his father was really rude to his mom as well and she didn't say anything, she just stayed silent. Over the course of the months that ensued, because I was away at college and I only saw my family briefly on some weekends, they didn't have any clue what was going on. Over the months that followed, there came times when we would fight viciously and Brian would hit me, he would punch me, he would grab my arms, he would do different things to me to hurt me because he got so angry. And then he would always cry and apologize and beg me not to leave and tell me that he couldn't live without me and that he would hurt himself or commit suicide if I tried to leave because he just couldn't live without me and that he needed me to help him so that he could be a better person and I believed him and I felt sorry for him and I just knew that I had to help him. But 
it escalated over time. I remember one time he pushed me out of his truck. He was driving on the freeway and he had slowed down at least, so he was probably going about 45 miles an hour, but he opened the door and pushed me out. And we were right by Miller Park and it was really late at night, so thankfully there weren't any cars on the road and it was right by like a grassy area. So I was very, very fortunate because I really didn't get hurt other than getting banged up pretty bad. And I think I probably got a concussion, but you know, he felt really bad about it and he did come back and pick me up. And I went with him because I didn't have any other options. It was like after midnight and, you know, we had these kind of fights where he'd get so furiously angry at me. I remember one time he draped all the mirrors in my dorm room and told me not even bother looking because I was so ugly that I shouldn't even bother looking in the mirror. And then I remember another time that he forbade me to eat anything because he said that I was getting way too fat and he would tell me when I was allowed to eat and that I wasn't allowed to eat anything without his permission. And I remember losing a ton of weight and I think I got down to, gosh, probably about 90 pounds and I started feeling really sick. And um, then I started sneaking food and not telling him and he caught me and he was really, really angry. And he just said that I would always be an ugly loser and nobody would ever want me and those kind of had become his anthem over the months and I really believed it because I'd been through already just a long many years of not feeling wanted, not feeling loved, and not being popular, not having any friends. So I guess I really believed it and I guess this is one thing about abusers and about the whole thing with domestic violence. They really do go through a grooming period like we said in the interview. It doesn't just happen right away. Gradually over time an abuser will strip you of your dignity. They will make you believe that nobody else could ever want you. They will make you believe that you are stuck with them because they're doing you a big favor by being with you. And many times there is a game of this psychological manipulation that will happen where they will manipulate you into believing that you absolutely can't leave them because either they're gonna hurt themselves or they're gonna hurt someone else or they're gonna hurt you and it will all be your fault because you will have chosen to leave them. So you do feel really, really trapped and that's exactly how I felt. And everything really escalated and it got worse and worse and worse. And I remember trying to hide the bruises on my face with makeup. And I remember being in the, the phase where even in the summer I wore long sleeve shirts or I always wore a sweatshirt. I lied and said bruises are on my neck where he had tried to choke me with his hands were hickeys because we were making out, which totally wasn't true. Nobody knew because on the weekends, I went home with him and I lived with him on the weekends. I was away from school. I told my parents I was happy at school. I never told them anything about Brian. They didn't like Brian because he was so much older than me and they wanted me to be with someone that was more my age and who had more goals and ambitions in life. And I think that they always felt like something was off about Brian, which obviously there was. And clearly I think they did have intuitions about really feeling misgivings towards him, but I never led them to believe that anything was truly wrong. So they never thought that there was anything seriously wrong. But when I was with him, I was so on edge. I felt so uncomfortable. I felt so fearful. I never knew when the other shoe was going to drop, what he was going to get angry at me for. If we were out shopping or something and a male clerk looked at me a certain way or talked to me, he would get furiously angry. I think the final last straw came when I was with him one weekend and he got furiously angry and I don't know, we were fighting and I was trying to leave and I said that I just wanted to go back to school, I wanted to leave, I didn't want to stay with him and he wouldn't let me leave and that's when he pulled out a knife and pinned me to the bed and he had the knife to my throat and he threatened to rape me at knife point to get me pregnant so that I would always have a connection to him and I could could never leave him. And this was the final straw that really, really scared me a lot because then I knew that he was capable of real harm and it really scared me. And I, you know, pleaded with him and begged him not to do anything and he didn't and he ended up crying and again saying he was sorry. Clearly looking back, there was some severe mental illness with him going on. But I remember 
staying with him and just playing along because I was too scared to do anything else. But I remember when he took me back to school, that's when I decided I'm gonna leave him. I can't do this anymore. I need to leave him. That last incident had made me really fearful for my safety because I realized he really wasn't well. And that's the point that I realized that he was truly potentially capable of really hurting me and it scared me. So I made a plan. The next night, I went to a private Christian college, so at 11 o'clock at night, they locked the dorms down, everyone had to leave, and there weren't any visitors allowed until the next day. That night after the dorms were locked and I knew he couldn't get in, I called him and broke up with him. And I knew that he would be furious and he was crying and begging me to reconsider, but I just hung up at him. He kept calling me, but I didn't answer. The next morning, I had a really early class, and he knew this, and so it was about 7.30. I was in the cafeteria with a friend eating breakfast, and I was on my way to class, and because it was so early, there weren't a lot of people around campus at all. I didn't realize he came into the cafeteria and grabbed me and started yanking me by my hair down the hall yelling and screaming at me and telling me that I was gonna regret this and he was gonna take me out of school and I was going with him and I was so, so fearful. I was yelling and I was screaming, but there was no one in the hall. There was nobody around to help me. And at this time, there was no campus security until about four o'clock in the afternoon, so I was pretty helpless. Thankfully, my friend came running after us. She grabbed him enough to distract him that he let go of me. I ran in my room. I called my parents. They told me to call 911. I did. I think he got arrested. I ended up having to file two restraining orders against him. My parents ended up having to file two restraining orders against him. One where we lived at home, where I spent my weekends sometimes, and then one at school so he couldn't be near me. He ended up losing his job because he called in sick to work so that he could come and harass me at school. And thankfully, my parents were friends with the owners of the grocery store where we both had worked. So he lost his job, he got arrested, and there were a couple restraining orders filed. But I lived for many years after that in fear, and it was through many years of counseling and just really coming to terms with this. And unfortunately, this kind of led into a chain reaction where I did allow myself to get involved in some other situations with men, unfortunately, that did become abusive to different varying degrees because I really really didn't get over this for a long time and I really needed to heal and I really needed to value myself enough and really learn to set boundaries and understand that this was not okay. Once a woman is treated this way, it's very, very hard for her to really see herself in a different light and really reframe her own thought process about who she is, her worth, her value, setting boundaries becomes really, really challenging and really valuing self-care becomes really important but also really hard as well. And it took me many, many, many years to get to a point where I could do that. But this was really, really a challenging situation. And the one thing I can say about this situation too, as it was unfolding, nobody knew what was going on. And I ended up telling my parents some things that happened, some things I didn't share. I didn't share everything that happened here because some of it is just really too painful and it's really pretty horrific and, you know, just not something I really think I need to share. But I did share a lot of the main highlights of the gist of our relationship. But I will tell you that a lot of psychological damage was done and that's really common with abusers. They really prey on women that have poor self images or that really don't feel good about themselves, remember what I said in my video on boundaries. If you haven't seen that, I wanna encourage you to watch that. I will link that at the end of this video, but it is really, really important that you train and teach people how to treat you by setting your boundaries up front right away so that you can make it known what your worth and value is from the get-go and what you will and will not accept and tolerate in the way that you're treated. I just didn't understand and know how to do that. I was so young. I really had never had a serious boyfriend before and you know, this was my first experience, but it's just a word to the wise, you guys. This can be going on all around you and you may never, never know unless you really open your eyes. And it is your responsibility if you see something happening that you need to do something, you need to intervene, please, please do that. And please do that with resources. Please 
educate yourself so you have the resources readily available to really help someone if they need it because it is important. You can end up saving somebody's life. It is that critical and that important. So I really want to implore you to really do that because you can really make a difference and you can really end up changing someone's life and potentially saving someone's life in the long term. So that's my story. I think that a lot of people that know me now would be surprised that this happened to me, but I wasn't always the person that I am today. And I thank God that I am currently the person I am today. I thank God for my strength and for my bravery. And I thank God that I have the wonderful family that I have now. And I'm so grateful for all my blessings, but most of all, I'm really grateful for the blessing of really understanding and valuing the woman that I am and knowing that I'm worth being treated well, that I'm worth respect, and understanding that my pain and suffering in my past still has value to hopefully help others today. I hope it brought some awareness to you. I hope that it helped you realize the importance in becoming educated. And if you are a woman out there that is suffering in silence, please don't. You're worth so much more. Wow, I was really surprised. I thought I was gonna make it through this video without getting emotional, but I guess that didn't happen. But the one thing I wanna say, and what makes me so emotional, really, is not the abuse that I suffered, not the times that I almost lost my life at the hands of this abuser, but the fact that I wish that somebody would've really looked around and paid attention and noticed that I was suffering and told me that I was valuable. And I don't blame my family because they weren't around me very much because I was away at school, but even another young person at college, a professor, someone that saw me often, because I know that I eventually became a shell of myself. I lost a lot of my friends in college because I just was never around and I didn't feel comfortable being around them because I didn't feel like hiding what was really going on. It became increasingly difficult for me to lie about my situation, but I wish somebody would have paid attention and just told me that I was worthwhile and valuable and I deserve to be treated well because that might have changed my situation sooner. So I'm here to tell you, if you're in a situation that you shouldn't be, if you're in a situation that makes you feel bad about yourself, that makes you feel vulnerable, that makes you feel unsafe or not happy, if you're with somebody that doesn't value you, you are valuable, you are worth more, and you really need and deserve to feel loved, and most importantly, to feel safe. So I really encourage you, please, 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 use the resources that I'm gonna share, get the help you need. There is support out there, even if it doesn't come from the people who claim to love and care about you. There are resources, there are people out there that will care about you, that will help you. Please get the help that you need, and please know that you are valuable Valuable, that you're worthy of so much more and please don't allow yourself not for one more day to be in a situation that makes you feel unloved unworthy and most of all unsafe please please I'm begging you to get the help you need I'm so happy to be able to do this video for you. I hope you found it valuable. Please share this video if you know of someone that could benefit from this or needs to see the resources that I'm gonna share in the description box below. Please like this video if you like it and please subscribe to my channel because I'm all about helping you change your life and change the life of others. With that, thank you so much for watching and remember to make your everyday ordinary life extraordinary.